Welcome to another uh, special episode of Orinoco Tribune. And this episode will focus on Haiti and whatever is happening in the country at the moment. And I should say, I said whatever is happening because a lot of things are happening in very quick succession. It's very difficult to follow. And I, I would say that there are more than enough reports of violence and, of course, the deeply racist portrayal of Haitians being ungovernable. People. So there is also the ongoing invasion attempt against Haiti, and I should say the latest invasion attempt led by the United States as usual, but with Kenya as a face or as you called black face. And the, I would say the already unsustainable political situation in Haiti has also exploded with the head of the de facto government, the unelected Prime Minister, or rather ex-Prime Minister Ariel Henry, resigning and unable to return to his country, as the aforementioned gangs have allegedly blocked the Haitian airports. So in order to discuss all these things and to put them in context and to try to understand where the country might be heading, we have with us a journalist Kim Ives of Haiti Liberty. So Kim is a journalist, documentary maker, and an authority on Haitian issues. He is the founder of the weekly newspaper, Haiti Liberté, where he is a writer and an editor. Previously, he wrote, edited, and photographed for IT Progress for 23 years. He has also written for numerous other publications, such as The Guardian, The Nation, The Intercept, The Progressive, Jacobin, and many more. And some of his well-known documentaries include Peter Kane, and I'm going to mispronounce this, I see in Leve Confe, The Coup Continues, Killing the Dream, and Resistance. And his most recent work is the documentary series, Another Vision, Inside Haiti's Uprising, jointly directed with Dan Cohen. Ives is a member of uh, Crowing Rooster Arts, a film collective specializing in films on Haiti. Ives is also a founding member of the International Support Haiti Network, formerly the Haiti Support Network, and has led numerous delegations to Haiti since 1986 to investigate human rights violations, union struggles, peasant land conflicts, and state enterprise privatization campaigns led by well, fake governments, let's say. Uh, Kim Ives is one of the four pundits in a very popular Creole language two-hour Sunday afternoon program, Haiti and Ondes Serum Verite, broadcast on Radio Pano, based in Brooklyn, New York. He is a frequent guest on radio and television networks and shows, including on Al Jazeera, Democracy Now!, RT, CCTV America, National Public Radio, The Hill, The Real News Network, Turkish TV, uh, Radio Sputniks, By Any Means Necessary, and Political Misfits, programs I right, really like, and uh, several Pacifica Network and Progressive Radio Network programs. So uh, thanks a lot, Kim, for joining us today and for your valuable time also. Thank you, Saheli. And just, uh, I have to update that uh, this curriculum vitae. I am simply a founder of Haiti Liberté. Oh, yeah. was five this, guys. That was, uh -huh. that was the, my mistake. Yeah. Oh, okay, I, good. And, I know uh, you yeah, and a couple of those shows have have gone the way of all flesh, um, uh, but but it's all right. Yeah, it's a couple. Yes, of I understand. Uh, with the diversification yeah. going on everywhere, right. so RT, I suppose I don't even know if CCTV America still functions. But anyway, it's uh, it's yeah um, yeah C CGTN now, right? I yeah, it's CGTN. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah. CGTN now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we, I, I remember because when I was a child, it was CCTV and it used to come to India, no yeah. longer. Yeah. But anyway, so I'll start with the thing that I first mentioned, the gang violence. So the principal characterization of Haiti in mainstream media, as well as in most alternative media, I would say, is that it is a country besieged by gang violence. You are among the minority of people who have called this a biased depiction or rather a simplified depiction. So what is the reality of this gang violence in Haiti? Uh, I mean, who are these gangs and what are they really doing? Yeah, um, I might be in the 
minority of pundits, but I think the majority of people understand that the purpose of the imperialist narrative is to demonize and criminalize any resistance. And so the same way in 1915, when they were invading Haiti, they called the resistance forces bandits. Today, they have to call them gangs, which has a very pejorative, a very criminal connotation. And these are fundamentally neighborhood committees with the debilitation of the state due to neoliberal reforms that began in earnest in 1986 after the fall of the Duvalier dictatorship. A lot of the state services and power fell away and essentially communities began to have to fend for themselves. And so the neighborhood committees became in fact the state in many neighborhoods of the city, especially as it began to mushroom as peasants were driven off the land by these same neoliberal reforms, the dumping of rice and various other commodities on the country, not only by the United States, by the neighboring Dominican Republic, uh, by other countries, and the crushing of uh, uh, Haitian agriculture, driving millions of peasants into the cities. Uh, as I've said, Port-au-Prince has basically grown six times in size from about 500,000 when I started to work there in the early 80s till today. Uh, it is now 3 million people about and uh, growing. So this phenomenon, which is not unique to Haiti, which we see throughout really Latin America, Africa, Asia, is um, creating these, these time bombs uh, of people who are unable to survive. And so the gangs uh, the, are essentially divided in two groups. You have one, some neighborhood committees, which arm themselves and become criminal, kidnapping people, raping, extorting, doing all kinds of, um, you know, robberies. Uh, and then there are communities, which they used to prey on, which drive them out. And they band together and they, they tried to keep the criminal gangs out of their neighborhood. That is what happened with Jimmy Cherizier. He did that in his neighborhoods of Delma 2, 4, and 6, which are basically in the middle of Port-au-Prince. And he succeeded in creating this crime-free zone. And then he tried to expand it to other neighborhoods, or, or he tried to, I should say, ally with other neighborhoods, which were doing the same thing with other neighborhood leaders who had the same vision, who said, we cannot you know, be prey to these criminals. Uh, we have to have some order. And Haiti, Haitian culture is a very orderly culture. You know, Haitians, it's not common you'll see a Haitian as poor as they might be. They might have no food in their belly for two days, but they will dress nicely. They will put on a pressed pair of pants and a clean a shirt as they can find. And, you know, they, 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 they try to do things in an orderly way. And so uh, there was or has been this really response to the criminals of trying to establish order. And in fact, in the countryside of Haiti, there are very few police. You very rarely find police. Most of the justice done out there is what they call expedited justice, where if some guys are trying to rob or do some crimes in an area, population comes out, they have their machetes, and you know they finish with the people right on the spot. So um, in any case, this 
growth of the fight between these anti-crime neighborhoods and the criminal neighborhoods uh, has basically been the story of the past five years in Haiti, uh, a fight between the coalition that Jimmy Cherizier built called the G9 and the criminal coalition, which was formed the very next day called the JPEP. And they have been butting heads, uh, occasionally having truces and pieces, but butting heads for the past five years. But finally, um, they have, uh, well, in that period, the US always called anybody with a gun who was of the popular classes, a gang. Like the bourgeoisie up in the hills of Port-au-Prince, they're all armed. They have whole arsenals in their homes, sometimes 100, 200 guns. They don't call them gangs, but any popular person who has a gun He's a gang member. They're gangs. They're all criminal. And in my UN address in December 2022, I stressed this. I said they putting the good guys and the bad guys all in one basket called the gangs. So, um, yeah, this gang, pe people have to understand the nuances and the political purpose of the use of the word gangs and gang violence, which is really nothing more than the terminology that they're using so they can justify foreign military intervention. Once again, for the third time in three decades, the first time having been in 1994, uh, that they're, they're, they're trying to do it once again. And of course, there was the 1915 to 1934, 19-year US Marine military occupation of Haiti as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot, Emilio. Uh, Haiti has been a country that has been actually besieged by imperialism from the day it was born as an independent country. Uh, and it is understandable that the imperialists will be calling the anti imperialist gangs irrespective of who they are. So, uh, in the current, coming to the current Haitian crisis, uh, I would say that one of the main figures, or at least one of the more invisible figures in the crisis is the, well, now ex-prime minister. Well, he was never a real prime minister anyway, but the ex-prime minister, Ariel Henry, who announced on 12th March, I think, that he was going to resign. So who is this person? Like, who is Ariel Henry? From where did he come? And what has been his role behind the situation, the current crisis in which I defines itself. Ariel Henry is a neurosurgeon, a brain surgeon, um, who I could say has for at least the last 20 years been one of the uh, Washington's principal agents in Haiti. They, they select certain individuals um, historically to be their sort of lead agent in Haiti. Um, they're the ones who make declarations, who head a civil society group, who do, you know, behind the scenes maneuvering, lobbying, organizing, et cetera, for US interests. Ariel Henry, as far as I know, first played a key role for the US as a member of what was called the Council of Sages in, 19, in 2004. The US carried out a coup d'etat against President Jean-Bertrand Aristide on February 29, 2004. And so now they had the problem of how to create the semblance of a legitimate process. Um, and it was not legitimate at all. It was completely just manufactured, all this mumbo jumbo uh, that they created to somehow justify their intervention and coup. But uh, they accounted what's called, they, they established what's called the Council of Sages. I believe it had six members 
Um, and Ariel Henry was one of them. And the purpose of these six member council of sages, you know, which was just completely <laughs> arbitrarily established was to select a new government, which had been already picked and already selected by the US, uh, a prime minister who had been a former uh, international uh, financial institution functionary for decades, a guy called Gerard La Tortue, and then a president who was uh, 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 Boniface Alexandre. Uh, so this Council of Sages had that role. So he was first part of it. He played in that. And he, he was deployed in different sectors. Originally, he had been sort of a part of it, the social democratic currents, uh, which surrounded President René Preval, who was in some ways sort of the mentor and the people would call him Aristide's twin. They ended up really uh, not very good terms, uh, but uh, in the popular eyes and imagination, they remained twins because they're both sort of small in stature and similar sort of physically. And René Preval um, uh, had a couple of, I could say, parallel social democratic parties, one called Pampra, which became Fusion, and uh, Ariel Henry was somewhat associated with this sector, the social democratic sector, but he gradually moved over into the next sector, kind of a neo devaluers far right current called the Haitian bald headed party PHTK, which brought in M Michel Martelly and afterwards Chauvenel Moise. So he moved over into the Martelly camp. So he had contacts everywhere in the social democratic, basically, let's call them the democratic party of the uh, Haitian political class uh, to the PHTK, which we'll call the Republican Party of the Haitian uh, political class. And um, so when Jovenel Moise was uh, faced with trying to find a prime minister in June of 2021, he had to select somebody who would please people. And he had a phone call with President Michel Martelly, at whom he was at odds, uh, to some extent, with former Prime Minister Laurent Lamotte, who, with whom he was pretty much in tune. Um, so Martelly, in that phone call, was very insistent that he <clears throat> put in Ariel Henry. And finally, Jovenel and Lamotte kind of relented too. They relented and said, okay, we'll put in Jovenel, uh, we'll put in uh, Ariel. And so on the Monday, the 5th of July, 2021, they said, Ariel Henry is the new designated prime minister. He will be sworn in on July 7th. Unfortunately, unfortunately, on the morning of July 7th, at 1 a.m., 1.15 a.m., Chauvenel Moise was machine gunned to death by this Colombian hit squad that had been infiltrated into the country two months, three months earlier. And uh, he never was sworn in. So the interim prime minister at that period was a guy called Claude Joseph, who was similarly um, had been used by the U.S. previously in the coup against Aristide in 2004 as sort of a student agitator. But he was younger, less tested, maybe less trusted. And so there was a brief chest bumping period between Claude Joseph and Ariel Henry for about two weeks. And finally, after two weeks, the US with a tale of 
Quisling em embassies, basically its allies, uh, Canada, France, Spain, Brazil, unfortunately, and a few others, you know, OAS and so forth, um, designated Ariel Henry to be the prime minister. Uh, they did it with a tweet. And that's how he became prime minister, basically through the vote or dictate or consensus of the U.S. and its allies. And uh, so he never had any legal uh, during the next two years that he was in power. Uh, the parliament completely expired. And so there are absolutely no elected officials in Haiti Day. And Ariel Henry just became a strong man whose strength came from the backing of the U.S. State Department. So essentially, this episode we've just seen where he left the country, Jimmy Cherizier gathered together his new alliance of armed groups and they shut down the airports or they shut down the airport in Port-au-Prince. Um, people in Cape Haitian shut down theirs on their own. And those are the only two airports a plane carrying his delegation could land. And um, that's where we are today. Uh, yes, uh, that's a well, yeah, that's I wouldn't say that's a very a little more than you bargained for in terms of <laughs> no, but it's not very unsurprising. I didn't know yeah. that he was a brain surgeon. I mean, <clears throat> he could have had a good career in that instead of doing all this. That's right, I know. Instead of doing Boy, all this. Somebody should give him some brain surgery, it sounds like. <laughs> but anyway, uh, a brain surgeon without a brain himself is so uh, yeah, a, bit, yeah, a yeah. bit rare thing, but anyway, so I, I was. Asking you, I was going to ask you something else related to the um, related to Henry's resignation. So you, you described him as someone without a country. So he was unable to return to Haiti uh, because, as you mentioned, the airports were sh shut down by the gangs. So at the same time, if I'm not wrong, there was a meeting in Jamaica between the U.S. Secretary of State and Tony Blinken and the CARICOM. Uh, which adopted some resolution about something, and then Ariel Henry announced his resignation. So what has been the role of both? I mean, I, the gangs and the Jamaica meeting led by Anthony Blinken behind this stepping down by Henry. Well, just like the Council of Sages and so forth in 2004, the U.S. recognizes the need to create something to take power because right now, and this is a huge advantage for this revolution, you know, there's nothing that's in any way <laughs> sanctified by a vote. Uh, everything is, is it's essentially a tabula rasa in Haiti right now. So Blinken made an emergency visit to Jamaica using, again, a black-faced diplomatic front in the form of CARICOM. It's not all of CARICOM, uh, but three countries in particular he's relying on. Guyana, whose president, Irfan Ali, is uh, one of the principal uh, proxy tools in the war against Venezuela today, as we know. Uh, over the debate over the um, contested territory of, you'll fill it in for me, Saheli. Um, Esequibo. <laughs> Esequibo, thank you. And uh, then Barbadian Prime Minister Mia Motley, who uh, has <laughs> also been showing herself to be more royalist than the king. And then, of course, uh, Jamaica's Andrew Holness, who is uh, the uh, prime minister there, who has been hosting many of the CARICOM meetings. So he ran down there and they first had a meeting. There were no Haitians present where they decided what was going to be done, you know, how they were going to put it together. And then they, you know, brought in a few Haitians and <laughs> mostly on Zoom, as I understand it. And they announced their big new formula, which was 
essentially the entire Haitian political class <laughs> with seven members, uh, a seven member uh, presidential commission, tr tr transitional presidential commission, seven members voting and two members who are observers, civil society and the religious sector. You know, uh, you know, this, this is just all names they give their puppets, their, their, their quizlings. So um, <clears throat> this uh, was rolled out in one day, you know, I mean, obviously it had all been decided at the State Department uh, days before, you know, this is what we'll do, we gotta get, Lavalas is one. Lavalas, unfortunately, has become the, the you know one of the most reactionary, or I could say, uh, uh, accommodating uh, political players in Haiti over the past uh, two decades, uh, three decades maybe. Um, and uh, we got to get Petit Dessalines, which is a breakaway from Lavalas, headed by Moïse Jean Charles. And then they had a few other of the political class parties like Ede of Claude Joseph, uh, Red, which includes Senator Yuri Latortu and a few others, uh, Senator um, uh, uh, Lambert from the South, um, uh, Southeast, I should say, the um, coalition, which called the December. 21st coalition, which included all Ariel Henry's Confederates and, uh, and a few others. So basically the, the length and breadth of the Hades political class. Um, and most importantly, maybe the uh, group called the Montana group, which had been really the number two contender for Ariel Henry's spot. And this is uh, combined of a lot of, or led, I should say, by a lot of the people who championed the coup against Aristide in 2004, uh, with a fringe of, uh, we call them the NGO left, uh, who also supported the coup against Aristide in 2004. But here they were basically trying to get Washington's nod to be the new group leading Haiti. We've written quite a bit about this in Haiti Liberté. Uh, so this coalition was put together, but Senator Moïse Jean Charles, who had gone into an alliance only two or three weeks, two weeks earlier, uh, with Guy Philippe, who we can talk about in a minute, who was a uh, leader of that 2004 coup d'etat, the armed forces, the, the, uh, the armed quote unquote rebels that helped dislodge Aristide in 2004. Moise, who had fought with Philippe up in the north of Haiti back in 2004, when he came through Moise's hometown of Milo, <coughs> they, they made a coalition <coughs> um, called the Tet Heads Together to Save Haiti Coalition. And they announced the government. They, 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 they proposed a provisional government. And um, so this was basically the first proposal on the table, which was ostensibly at least completely Haitian devised, led, proposed, uh, you know, it, it concocted. And it had the support of many groups allied with the coalitions around each of those leaders. So he, who had been proposed in Blinken's formation, um, he said, I reject it. I'm not gonna, you know, oh, this is crazy. Uh, we, we, we've overthrown the government and now I'm gonna sit down and negotiate with the, that same government. Uh, and everybody clapped. We had him on the front page of Haiti Liberté on Wednesday on the bottom, you know, he rejects it, you know. And um, then the next day he flipped. He said, no, okay, I will go into it. And he's, he's since gone into Blinken's formulation saying that the Russians, the Russians convinced him to go into it, which is a total lie. I, we have contacts uh, with Russian diplomats, which we called and, you know, said, is that true? 
And they said, absolutely not, you know, and other uh, sources that I have who also speak to uh, Russian di diplomats said exactly the same thing. The Russians said, we had not, nothing to do with that. Don't, don't put us in it. So uh, this is typical Moïse Jean-Charles. He's, he's a very mercurial character who has uh, generally had a left-leaning um, reputation, but who is ready to do pirouettes and totally go in the opposite direction after, you know, uh, promising not to do so. So everybody right now, as we speak, uh, is is very dismayed, very disgusted, really, with uh, Moise's about face. And um, so they're pushing to get this through as fast as possible so they can get U.S. Uh, proxies on the ground in the form of Kenyan, Beninian, Chadian, Spanish, Barbadian, uh, well, but I left out a few others, Bahamian boots on the ground in Haiti to crush this uprising. <laughs> okay, so it seems that the entire political class, or, or maybe almost the entire political class of Haiti is with this. I was actually going to ask you about it, but you answered already what is the position of the political parties. And one can understand that why there would be gangs, because uh, whom you can trust in the political parties, right? In fact, I, I had seen uh, Moise Jashar with President Maduro like, when he had a left left sort of reputation. And I had imagined that he would be skipping to it, but of course, it seems that he didn't. So um, mm -hmm. since we have talked about the political class, I would also ask you about um, the role of especially Jimmy Sharice here, not only in the armed insurgency, but specifically about what role did G9 and other forces around G9 played in forcing Henri to resign? Like how much political power does Sharice here and the organizations around him have to make Ariel Henry resign or at least play a part in his resignation? Well, as I explained a little earlier, um, after that dress rehearsal of autumn 2022, he decided to unite with the criminal gangs of the JPEP into a new front called the Viva Sum. And we posted online through uncaptured media, the uh, uh, media outlet of Dan Cohen, my collaborator on uh, films of the past uh, two or three years, uh, another vision, um, uh, as well as uh, a redacted piece and a piece that we're about to release on the current situation. Um, and in that extended video, you you see a discussion between Jimmy Cherisier and his former foes of Bel Air, which was one of the neighboring and principal opponents he'd been fighting with for years, uh, saying, you know, we're, we're going to stop fighting among each other and we're going to fight against the oligarchy. So this Vivan Sum coalition essentially uh, was responsible for stopping Ariel Henry. And this was something which I could say the Haitian population was quite leery of when it was first announced, but I received many calls from many Haitians who said, well, the ends justify the means. That is, <laughs> they managed to get Ariel out, and this was the overwhelming demand of so many people. And so this got Jimmy Cherizier's stock very, very high. You know, he is riding high right now. Now, working with these criminal gangs, they're undisciplined. It's not an army. It's not, um, it's not the July 26 coalition of Fidel in 1958. Uh, this is a um, somewhat uncontrollable uh, force 
which can do bad things. And in fact, Jimmy Cherizier has made a press conference or two where he said, listen, people, you know, do not, the, the guns are not against the people. They're against the, 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 the oligarchy. They're against the police. They're against the, the status quo. So please uh, do not do any exactions against the people. Um, I've heard some reports saying the, 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 the armed groups have been better. There's less fighting, less violence. But at the same time, there have been some cases uh, which have been bad of people's houses burned or, or so forth. Now, in any war, in any conflict, in any revolution, you're going to have collateral damage. You're going to have opportunists who take advantage of the situation to settle scores or to, you know, grab something they wanted from somebody else, uh, et cetera. So, uh, but of course, in the age of universal cameras and cell phones and social media, uh, these things can be amplified and used to basically discredit the process. And that's what's happening to some extent. I think that, um, you know, Sherry Sye is trying to walk, you know, bring this force forward. And he remains to me one of the principal uh, voices and I could say uh, authorities in, in the current situation. The other one is Guy Philippe, who is, as I said, this former rebel leader from 2004, who was um, basically cast off by the U.S. in 2004 after he played a pivotal role in helping to overthrow Aristide, which was a terrible thing. Uh, I mean, we, we wrote greatly against it when I was at Haiti Progre and also at Haiti Liberté. We used WikiLeaks documents to, you know, more or less talk a bit about his um, uh, very unfortunate bad role in, in, in that. But he was ironically coming really almost from an ultra left position, I could say, uh, because his feeling at the time was that Aristide had betrayed his vows of the 1990s and become some kind of uh, uh, sellout, even though he himself <laughs> to cure this selling out, in his words, uh, ended up working with the U.S., getting funding and weapons and I'm sure some kind of financial support from the U.S. Uh, and so when the U.S. put him aside and then a few years later uh, accused him of drug trafficking and uh, began to send teams to go try to arrest him, which he alluded, he became very, very angry. And uh, it, is, it seems, and uh, quite uh, bitter against the US, uh, not only double crossing him and betraying him, but you know, pursuing him. And eventually they organized his capture in 2017 he had gone on to become the elected senator of the South, where he is very popular. He is from the South. He had his base in a town called Pestel, a very picturesque, beautiful town on the southern coast of Haiti. And um, uh, is some sort of hero of the South. And uh, when he went to a radio interview in Port-au-Prince as senator-elect, they swept in and arrested him. Uh, and took him to Miami and charged him with drug trafficking and money laundering. He's always vehemently uh, denied those charges. And we've looked at them and see that they're pretty flimsy. Uh, it's <laughs> quite apparent that there was a lot of fast and loose playing. 
But his lawyer apparently in Miami said, listen, you're, you know, it was conspiracy to commit money laundering. And the minute you hear, hear the word conspiracy in it, you're, you're basically cooked because they can, they can say anything's a conspiracy. So he, he took a plea deal, even though he tried to renege on that uh, and bring a lawsuit to overturn it and got $100,000 uh, uh, in, in uh, compensation which he dropped after that. I'm not sure why he dropped it, but he did. In any case, he got a nine-year sentence, which with good conduct, you get out in about seven. He, he served about six and a half years, six years, eight months, I think, in jail in the U.S. So he was brought back to Haiti on November 30th of 2023. And he'd been doing a lot of interviews um, from his jail cells in the United States. He speaks English fluently, Creole, Spanish. He was trained in Ecuador to be a soldier. Uh, he went on to be a police chief. Um, so he started to give speeches. He's, he's a very, very articulate, eloquent speaker, silver tongue, as they say. And he began to give internet. Uh, he has a website. He began to give internet uh, talks, videos, and he made a sort of truck top tour of various towns around the country. And he went up to the north uh, where there was a canal being built off the Massacre River. Now, this is a big deal because this canal is the first canal, irrigation canal taken off the Massacre River in the north of Haiti. The Dominican Republic has 11 such canals off the river, but they took great exception to Haiti building one. And um, so there ended up being a sort of confrontation up there between the Dominicans and a force called the BASAP, which stands for the Surveillance Brigade for Protected Spaces. And this is a kind of a park ranger outfit, uh, armed. It began with about 300 park rangers. It's now numbers somewhere between 15 and 50,000, uh, mostly volunteer members who have kind of haphazard uniforms. Many of them have no arms, etc. But this confrontation between the BSAP agents in the Dominicans back in, I believe it was November of 2023, made these this force, the BASAP, the heroes of Haiti, defending Haitian sovereignty and the canal uh, uh, that's near the town of Wanamant. So the director of this force is a guy who's associated with Guy Philippe. And so Guy Philippe became sort of identified with this force. And he spoke up in Wanamant. He spoke in a few other towns. And his speeches are amazing. You know, there's they're nothing you can, can, can argue with them. Uh, you know, they're anti-imperialist. They're talking about Haiti's self-determination, independence, history, what they can do, denouncing the Americans, denouncing foreign intervention in Haiti and foreign meddling and Everything, you know, it's, 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 it's wonderful stuff and Haitians love it. And so he is, in many ways, I, I'll say the most popular figure in Haiti. And in a way, maybe, maybe more popular even than Cherizier, because Cherizier has been so demonized, so uh, had so much mud and, and feces thrown at him to demonize him as a gang leader and a criminal that, you know, this has Haitian public opinion just a little uneasy about him in some quarters. Some people are fanatically for him, many people. But um, Guy Philippe has also a lot, some bad press, but not as much. And his speeches are amazing. And they take a lot from Cherizier. They take a lot of the themes that Cherizier has been saying over the years. So they are almost, um, I could say, kindred spirits. Uh, and in the article that I did two days ago in Haiti, Liberté, 
about Ariel Henry's actually being some kind of prisoner in Puerto Rico right now, a pawn. Uh, I, I spoke the same day, Tuesday, this past Tuesday, to both Cherizier and to Guy Philippe. And Cherizier said, listen, if Guy Philippe comes in at the head of a presidential council, I have no problem. He's saying the same things. We, we're shooting for the same things. I hope he means it. I hope he keeps it. Um, so, and Guy Philippe also gave a kind of a nod to Cherizier in one of his speeches in Petit Guave in December. And he said, you know, to the quote unquote gangs, uh, please lay down your arms, follow commander. That's the word he used, commander, Jimmy Cherizier's um, advice and, and lead. So I think the two of them are, um, uh, basically looking for the same thing, giving the same message. And uh, so and this is a very long-winded answer, I know, to your question, but Jimmy Cherizier is playing an important role, but to some extent in concert and in step with Guy Philippe. Okay. Yes, I, actually, I was going to ask you about Guy Philippe, so yeah, you answered it before. Um, but anyways, I, I have, I read about him in Haiti Liberty and I saw that he was popular and he went to Port Prince. And I was also asked by people that why was he released early from the United States? I get I got the answer from you that with good conduct and stuff, his sentence was reduced. At least, I mean, mm -hmm. he was released before the end of his sentence. So there is there may be nothing in it, or there may be. And it's also very interesting because many ultra-left people have this kind of problems. Like he he has a similar sort of problems that ultra left leaders seem to have. Ended up meddling himself, and now talking against meddling, like foreign meddling and all. So I can yeah. I can understand. Like I I got I got my answer. That's why he's popular. What did it do? And yes, we yeah. were very. I would say that Orinoco Tribune, we were sort of apprehensive that a person like this who had participated in the coup against Aristide in 2004 now seems to be uh, now seems to be saying things that were very similar to Aristide in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. yeah, it's 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 well they very yeah, very similar. And and we too were apprehensive if you look at the arc of Haiti Liberté articles from early December when he just arrived until of late, you know, we've we've uh, in the beginning we're not really clear how how serious was he honest was he real was he sincere uh, was this some sort of psyop was he a plant did they do this on purpose um, you know so all those questions were going through our minds too but he's been very consistent he's you know seems very sincere. Um, and I could see how <laughs> he would be pretty miffed, pretty, pretty outraged with how the U.S. treated him, uh, even though I can't imagine why he would have gotten into bed with the U.S. in the first place in 2001 to 2004. Uh, I mean, I can understand uh, that, you know, maybe he wasn't fully developed, but he often cites Fidel, Thomas Sankara, Che Guevara, Hugo Chavez as sort of models. Uh, some people who are uh, would would say that at some point he he uh, held up Ronald Reagan and Augusto Pinochet. I don't know when he said those people were people he um, admires. I, I have to look back and see what that. I haven't had time to research that, but. In any case, uh, right now, whether you like it or not, Guy Philippe is very, very popular. And I think, uh, you know, if you had a presidential run, uh, he would be, um, you know, if not the winner, uh, very close to the winner. Uh, meanwhile, Aristide and the Fami Lavalas has been so completely... Um, uh, how shall I say, taking up the rear of the political class. They they oppose the uh, resignation of President Michel Martelly back in the 2000, 
15 period. Uh, they uh, were, uh, Aristide was meeting with Ariel Henry on several occasions. Um, and at one point their spokesman said, well, we <laughs> kind of a nonsensical statement, but we didn't put him so we can't remove him. Uh, it was what the um, uh, spokesman said. So, uh, and then they joined this council. And I think I neglected to say that before the condition for joining this council, this quote unquote Haitian led council that Blinken put together was that you have to agree with the foreign intervention of the Kenyan and the MSS force into Haiti. So, uh, you know, the fact that they once again have bent over, bowed down and gone into this is, is just outrageous and, and terrible. So uh, things have flipped, you know, here we have the, 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 the people standing up to the US and denouncing them and saying, we're not going along is Guy Philippe and the ones saying we're going with the US and we're going to be part of their government is uh, Lavalas. So uh, anyway, you know, as happens in these revolutionary periods, everything is topsy turvy upside down. And um, uh, but basically on the ultra left, yeah, a lot of people will point to for instance, former U.S. Ambassador Pamela White saying, oh, Guy Philippe, we should work with him. We can work with him. You see, that's proof that he's an agent. Well, OK, but you're agreeing with Brian Nichols and with mm -hmm. Anthony Blinken and with the CIA and the NED and all these. You know, you're taking one uh, agreed uh, ambassador who didn't play a great role, uh, Pamela White, but you're not denouncing all these others. So anyway, the, the, the larger picture, as we presented in our film, Another Vision, and in other uh, uh, writings in Haiti Liberté, is that, um, you know, this is a genuine uprising. Uh, and I think that both the Viva Sum coalition of Jimmy Cherizier and this Guy Philippe slash BSAP mm -hmm force that is uh, happening in the um, countryside mostly, not so much in Port-au-Prince. This is really country, the rest of Haiti sort of force. Um, and we, we visited, Dan Cohen and myself, we visited the BSAP base up in Cape Haitian and, uh, you know, spoke to them. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon to really see it uh, taking shape and it may play a very important role in the in the weeks ahead. Yes, I can see. I mean, yeah, it's it's really surprising and not at all understandable why a state who was overthrown by a U.S. intervention would now support another U.S. intervention right. in all shape and form except getting the U.N. seal and it would be even according to the UN, it's a non-UN mission. So right, and it should be said he was also invited the very first military or the very second military intervention in 1994 because he came back on the sh shoulders of U.S. troops in 1994. Oh. So mm -hmm. this was really opening the door to these interventions. That was uh, really really unfortunate that he agreed to it. My mentor and the head of our paper at the time, Haiti Progre, who had been his itinerant ambassador, resigned because mm -hmm. he he allowed that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's weird, but anyway. So since we are talking about, I mean, this this non-UN multinational security support mission or whatever they call it. So apart from yes. CARICOM, apart from uh, the Haitian political class in general, we also had the CELAC supporting this thing. So in the latest yeah. summit at the Kingston, Kingstown Declaration of that select summit held in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, expressed support for this US-led, basically a US intervention mission in Haiti, but they like cloaked the support in diplomatic jargon. And I quote, which I read from Haiti Liberté, we call for the prompt and effective implementation of the United States Security Council Resolution 2699, 2023, including the establishment of the necessary security conditions in Haiti 
as a means to hold the free and fair elections in Haiti and lay the foundations for long-term sustainable economic and social development in the country, strengthening security and addressing the underlying structural causes of ongoing violence and vulnerability. There is so much nonsense there, but anyway, so I have, the question is, why would Selak? Selak is like, he's supposed to be an alternative to the US Ministry of Colonies, that is the Organization of American States. So why would such an organization support a disguised invasion of Haiti, as President Maduro called it at the summit, and he expressed himself against it. So why would Selak support this? Right. Well, I think it was my my particular take is that it was ignorance. And I think what happened, and we, we can't underestimate the empire as 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 clumsy and stupid as its moves have been in recent months and from Palestine to Yemen to Haiti. Um because Secretary Blinken the week before the Salak summit flew to Brazil. He's like a firefighter putting out all the fires around the empire. He flew to Brazil to meet with Lula to push, I think, that Lula put this particular uh, item into the Salak statement. You know, So it was a kind of a judo move on the part of Blinken. And um, Lula, for all his excellent statements on Gaza and against Israel, has been still totally blind to the Haitian side of things. And I don't know if he's trying to justify or protect his legacy or what, but in any case, uh, I think probably behind the scenes at Salak, he was the one who said that we got to put this in, the Haitians, it's a terrible situation, there has to be something done. And I think a lot of the other countries may have not really read Resolution 2699, not really understood what it was. Thank God Maduro made his statement, he, and which was excellent, um, even though he made a not so good statement a few days later, kind of characterizing the, um, uh, the gangs, quote unquote, as similar to the, what was the movement called in Venezuela, where they used some lumpen groups to attack the government. Um, Guarimbas. Guarimbas, yeah, thank you. Uh, so the Guarimbas, you know, com the comparison doesn't match, doesn't fit, you know. So, uh, but, I, you know, at least I, I think that's an honest mistake. I can understand it. Uh, you know, Haiti's not central to uh, the core interests maybe of some of these countries, or they don't realize how central it is yet. But in any case, so I think this got in there through really negligence or, um, uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the members of SALAC not realizing, because uh, to me, the driving forces of SALAC are really Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Colombia, these countries who are uh, progressive anti-imperialist. And, and I think they should have been a little more... Um, shall I say, veatif, uh, uh, you say in Creole, and I guess the word in English is um, on their guard against uh, such kind of maneuvers. So uh, we would like to see that article removed or revisited, as we said in the piece. And we, we, we have been making um, uh, approaches on different levels to, to have that uh, addressed. And I, you know, I have faith that CELAC and the Latin Americans will and can see the um, uh, danger that would be presented by this MSS coming in. Because fundamentally, and again, for the Orinoco Tribune viewers and followers who are, uh, you know, I, I could say the, the hardcore of our, you know, movement, uh, the end goal of the U.S. and the reason why they're having to use these proxies is they want to get a U.S. military base into Haiti through a thing called the Global Fragility Act. And this act will basically have U.S. troops deployed in Haiti to defend against the fragility. Uh, and they'll then put Haiti on a humanitarian aid lifeline, basically the cheap rice, the cheap corn, the cheap flour, et cetera, 
will be pumped into the country. So they'll basically have Haiti on some kind of hospital bed with this infusions going in, guarded by the U.S. troops and keeping them out of the grips of China, which is, you know, marching across the world, winning people over with its win-win proposal of the Belt and Road Initiative. So this is Washington's response to the Belt and Road Initiative. And so the U.S. end game is getting the troops in there. So they can't really bring their troops in to put in somebody to invite them in. They need to have somebody else go in, make the fake election uh, or the, the orchestrated election, then invite them in and then they go in. So, you know, everything's optics with Washington in this uh, sort of a play. So people have to understand this. And if they do this in Haiti, Haiti is the test case. They're going to do it in other Latin American countries. They're going to try to do the same thing to them. So they have to see that Haiti is just the, the prototype, the, uh, the, the, the test case. So they can apply it in other countries and do the same thing. So um, I think it's very important for the Salak nations to uh, be aware of the danger that uh, you know Washington presents. Uh, you know we can maybe become dis complacent seeing the very quick collapse of the empire and the rise of the BRICS, but it ain't over. And you know they still got a lot of tricks up their sleeves. Yes, never underestimate the empire. We say all the time. Um, yeah. Uh, as for that, that's very unfortunate, uh, unfortunate comparison that Maduro made. I think that it originates from a new ongoing U.S. attempt to characterize the Venezuelan state as being part of a transnational organized crime organization sort of thing. So it's it's very new. I mean, we are working, we have been publishing stuff on it in the recent days. You know of the gang, Tren de Aragua, like organized crime gang, narco-trafficking, extortion, territorial war sort of thing. But it wasn't very big. I mean, it was problematic in Venezuela, but it wasn't like, you know, cartel de Sinaloa, no? But the United States is trying to portray it as such and say that this Tren de Aragua is operating all over the American continent, and it is a it is a situation like in Haiti, gang violence. So mm -hmm. they would just you know they have some stuff. They have like a 2017 presidential declaration and all these things they can use against Venezuela and say that we have to go. I mean, I think I think it is a build up to put Venezuela also on the Global Fragility Act list. And for yeah. the time being, it isn't. I think there is West Papua. I think there is, there might, must be two or three countries in Africa, apart from Haiti. But I think that yeah, there, there, there are five countries. It's uh, uh, Papua, New, Papua, Papua, Papua New Guinea. Guinea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Mozambique. Uh, Libya. Um, of Haiti, course. And then, and then they put as a country, I mean, that's typical, like when people say Africa is a country, right? They say West Africa. So they're talking about, I guess, Ivory Coast. and Yes, um, uh, could you be. Know, uh, you, you know, anyway. Yes, yes. Especially probably because in West Africa, there is all this, there are also all these military coups that are, you know, trying to exactly, fight against France. Right. So I exactly. think it could be the reason. Yeah. So yes, I think there is also a build up to put Venezuela also in that list, maybe a bit right. later in the future. And it could be that Maduro had that conflated that trend de Aragua with China in right. and all because yeah, gangs are gangs. I have heard this thing right. like people saying, well, gangs are after all gangs. How are you expecting them to become a political force? So yes, yeah. I can I can get it sort of, although it's unfortunate. So since yeah. we are uh, talking about the unfortunate situation in AG, so I I think I ask this I ask you this every time as the last question. So this time also okay. it is that. So what could okay. be the solution for Haiti? Like how could this the country get out of this cycle of destabilization, invasion, et cetera, and resume a really democratic path, you know, for its for the well-being of its citizens? Well, as the slogan has been in Haitian demonstrations since I was a kid, and says solution, revolution, uh, one solution, revolution. And uh, I think that's what we're seeing. 
we're seeing a, a revolution or the beginnings of it. Um, <laughs> the, the last Haitian social revolution was 13 years uh, minimum. And uh, I think that, you know, people have to understand a social revolution is different than a political revolution, which is what Aristide carried out in 1990, uh, where you just win the power in the political system, which can easily be turned back because the economic system isn't necessarily uh, uh, addressed uh, directly at, at that time. Uh, because the bourgeoisie then just, you know, puts together their money and organizes a coup, which is what happened in 1991, and again in 2004. But this is really a social revolution. It's Haiti's second social revolution, uh, which is where the means of production are change hands. That is the factories, the land, the, the banks, the stores, the the, the the foundations of the economy change ownership to the underclass. And, you know, this is a very messy problem. It hasn't been easy in any revolution, whether it's Russian, Chinese, Cuban, you name it. Uh, it's It's been a, a protracted long-term period. And those revolutions had organized communist parties leading it. Uh, in this case, you don't really have an organized communist party, uh, even though, um, you know, you may have elements or the embryos of organized communist parties who are seeing it. But on the left, you know, there are very few or uh, very few organized. Haiti Liberté is one uh, who really see the potential of this moment and what it really uh, can do. So we are trying to accompany the people as best we can uh, through forums like Orinoco Tribune and through other uh, media. But um, it's going to be a very difficult process. The only thing we have working in our advantage is the empire's patent collapse, which is happening. And uh, uh, we certainly hope that uh, we can uh, advise and take part in this change so that Haiti can finally get out of this absolutely unsustainable situation it has been in, uh, where its potential and its possibilities are, are not being um, used and exploited uh, or I should say used by the people and exploited by the people. They're being used and exploited by foreign interests to destroy the country, like gold mining, you know, which would destroy the water table or, um, you know, the growth of sisal in the north, which happened in the 1940s and 50s, which totally depletes the soil and make it, or makes it almost useless to grow food anymore. So, you know, if the Haitians in this canal uh, can finish with that. This canal project, which happened in the north, this was not done by the government. This was done by the local peasantry. They were the ones who said, we need this canal. It was started by Jovenel Moise. It might have been one of the reasons he was axed too. The, 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 the Dominicans may have had a hand in that. Uh, uh, $21 million to support this coup against him apparently came through Dominican banks. We have to follow that money one of these days. Um, so uh, this is the same way the canal was an almost spontaneous, organic, autonomous movement without the leadership of a party or the government or anything. This was the people themselves, the grassroots, in the most elemental sense, doing it. Uh, in a way, this revolution is the same thing. And... I think it's very easy to infiltrate it and to disrupt it and to confuse it and to destabilize it when you don't have that core party of seasoned militants like the Bolsheviks or like the July 26 movement or like the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, but nonetheless, nonetheless, um, Haitians have 
shown determination. We in Haiti Liberté have often referred to Haiti as the Palestine of the Western Hemisphere because of their dogged determination and face the great odds against them. And we hope, and we will work for, and dare I say, we'll even pray that this can be a successful revolutionary process. Mm -hmm. So thank, yeah, thank you for that answer. I think, uh, I mean, every every time you were on on with Torino Kachuvin, this is the third time. So every time you are on, you are, you, this answer gets a bit more expanded. So I, I, I hope that it's advancing really, although it may, from the outside, it may seem very chaotic and as long as it doesn't. As long as it doesn't go into hyperbole, yes, we'll, we'll try to keep it. No, no, no. I mean, it's not about hyperbolic. It's I'm talking about really like facts. Yeah. So it's advancing. It seems to be advancing, although from the outside, it seems like chaotic and messy and everything, which I mean, revolutions generally are. And I also think that well, there are people, Latin Americans, who actually like, accuse a lot of people, especially those who think of like who keep an eye on Haiti, what's happening there, etc. They claim that ah you have you put an outsized importance on Haiti. I think there is no importance on Haiti. Like even Selak does not understand what's happening there and brings out that terrible mm, resolution on whatever it was. So I think it is not an outsized importance. In fact, it's very little importance. It should have more importance. And those people who actually accuse us of putting an outsized importance on AT should be listening to this interview, should be listening to your, your staff also and to AT Liberty, I believe. So if you have any closing comments, et cetera, to make or where to follow you, et cetera, you can do it now. Well, the, the only closing statement I would say is and this kind of follows on what you just said, the international solidarity, the role of influential organizations like Orinoco Tribune and other progressive leftist, shall I say Marxist, um, uh, scientific organizations to really push back on the narrative because boy, I was looking at the headlines this morning and you know, they're even weaponizing the World Food Program to say, oh, it's a famine. Haiti is shattering. We have to go in. You know, they're pulling out all the stops. They're 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 <laughs> emptying their magazines uh, to uh, make this go through. So we really have to realize that right now, comrades, this is the moment where we have to get behind the Haitian Revolution and push back every possible way we can and try to get some of our comrades who are confused by the disinformation blizzard to see clearly and to see the potential and possibilities of this moment. Okay, so yeah, thanks thanks a lot for you know your time. I think we have been maybe one hour and 30 minutes or something so thanks a lot for the for your time and for all your for all these detailed descriptions explanations and everything and yes i think we should be less confused and try to follow the facts follow the money follow the power and everything that's happening behind the scenes to make it look like what it is ungovernable so thanks a lot for coming to today thank you Saheli. thank you for the third time, once again. Okay, we can have a fourth time also. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs>